Um, so uh, my handle for everything is Anna Nelson, and if you go to my Twitter, you can find the source code for the slides that I just tweeted. Um, and what I'm going to do is just go through a, an ASCII doc document, an HTML document, and this is actually also something that you can use as a starting point for your projects. So we'll get through as much of this as we can, um, and basically you can also read through this yourself, and you can also modify this document and use it as a starting point. Uh, so the source code for this is my username on GitHub is Anna Nelson, SciPy2015. Uh, is the repo. So I'm talking in general, as I usually am, about reproducibility f and reproducibility both for uh, reproducible research, which is what a lot of us are interested, um, but there's also a, lo a lot of overlap with software documentation. And it's also important that your, your documentation is also reproducible. And what I'm going to talk about here is applicable to both of those use cases. And I would hope that you'd be doing both of those at the same time as well. Um, so I wrote Dexy a couple of years ago to deal with the issue of a reproducible computational workflow, including getting your results into a document. And I'm, uh, I've been very happy with that, but what's made my life even easier and what's made Dexy even better is that we now have Docker on the scene. And the combination of Docker and Dexy is very, very powerful, and they're both using a lot of the same principles uh, around reproducibility. And so basically, what I'm talking about today is using Docker to generate a reproducible environment, and then within the context of that environment, using Dexy to do reproducible research in terms of generating uh, research documentation and software documentation. Um, so this is an approach that is practical to use right now today. You can be doing research using these tools in a reproducible way. Um, it's also an approach that is highly adaptable. So a Docker file is basically a glorified bash script. Um, you can do anything with it that you can do with a bash script, but it's going to be a nice reproducible system that's going to be generating an environment that's relatively portable and lightweight. Uh, and then Dexy is basically a wrapper around arbitrary code. So these are very, uh, these are tools with good defaults, but they're also tools that can really be adapted to a wide variety of use cases. So if this doesn't seem like something you could use straight away, uh, think about it, come talk to me, and we can brainstorm and see if maybe there's something to make this adaptable. Uh, so just a couple of blurbs. Um, Docker allows you to package an application with all of its dependencies into a standardized unit for software development. Docker is a one way to think about it is a very lightweight virtual machine because uh, it uses some features of the Linux kernel to be really, really lightweight. Um, and the nice thing about Docker is that there's tooling which allows us to build these virtual machines in a reproducible way from a script called a Docker file. Uh, and Dexy is a multi-purpose project automation tool with lots of features designed for working with documents. Um, and we're going to see how these work uh, right now. So, I probably don't need to say this, but, but let's just do the why should we automate? Why do we want to automate? Um, and I think fundamentally that automating is about making sure that your docs, your documentation, and your research is actually correct. So automation means you're not making all the types of manual errors that you can make. Um, but there's more. Uh, automation also saves you a lot of time in your day-to-day -day work. Um, and yes, there's an initial investment involved, uh, but once you make that initial investment and get into an automated way of doing things, really the, the amount you can save is, is just, it's huge. Um, sorry. Another thing, especially on, maybe more on the software documentation side of things, when you force yourself to work in an automated and reproducible way, it's going to really draw your attention to inefficiencies and awkward things in your startup. What tends to happen is we work on our own machine, we have it set up the way we like it, and we're just working away, but it's been so long since we set up our machine that we don't realize how much tweaking it took to get that environment right. But anybody else who's using your software is going to have to go through that process of, well, wait, what libraries did they install in which order? Maybe there's going to be a couple emails on the mailing list to figure that stuff out. If you're using a reproducible tool like Docker to configure your environment, you're going to have to figure out a, a really optimized ordering to install everything. But the nice thing is only you, only one person has to figure that out. All your users can either just run the Docker file directly or they can just use it as the basis for understanding, okay, here's what I would have to install to get this environment up and running on my own machine. 
Um, and then one of the, you know, similar to that, it's this implicit knowledge of, oh, well, you know, you've got to install the libpng. Yeah, sorry, we, yeah, we, we need, really need to document that. So just getting us away from that and by forcing ourselves into the discipline of automation, we solve a lot of these other communication and collaboration problems. Okay, so really all you have to do, assuming you have an existing project, uh, we're talking about adding two text files to your project. So we're talking about adding a Docker file, which is Docker's configuration, and a Dexy.yaml file, which is Dexy's configuration. So we're adding plain text configuration files that are then going to be executed to give us this environment. Uh, so this is a very helpful link, the Docker file best practices. If you're using Docker, check out the Docker file best practices. Um, and I also have a snippets repository that I basically put, I'll go ahead and open this one up briefly. So this is the Docker file where I put all the little snippets of things that I need to use from time to time. So this, this is a nonsensical Docker file on its, on its own because it installs absolutely everything. Uh, but if you need to remember, oh, how do I get OpenJDK or how do I get Ruby or how do I get R, um, this is where I keep my snippets and you're welcome to use it. So it has things like, um, this is a useful one, how to set up apt to install, uh, to not have to type dash Y in all your, in all your prompts, stuff like that. So you're welcome to use that. Okay, so now let's actually look at the Docker file for this example, which is how I generated uh, these notes, and this is sort of just a nice starting point for a Python-related software package. Uh, so we start with a from statement, so from Ubuntu latest. Um, I like to start with just a plain Ubuntu image uh, because that forces me to install everything. I know it's pretty generic. It's probably going to be the most broadly applicable. Um, you can start with a more uh, refined image that has some stuff pre-installed, but just remember if your goal is reproducibility, then well, what if that image goes away? Uh, so pretty sure Ubuntu is not going to go away, or at least it's generic enough that if something changed, this would be a pretty adaptable script. Um, and one thing with, with working with Docker, the Docker images are very, very minimal. They really have the bare minimum that you need because they're trying to be as small as possible. So one of the things you get used to when working with Docker is, yeah, there's these little configuration things we have to do that normally we don't do because the, the, the system setup wizard is going to do that with us. So you see some things in the script. So this is the sort of thing that you, you tease out over time or you go to someone's snippet repository and pick those up. Okay, so this is setting some defaults, uh, installing some developer tools. You have to install curl. You have to install uh, package config, stuff like that. So again, what you'd be doing in your own projects is figuring out what your particular package needs, refining this, and generating a Docker file that has hopefully the bare minimum or maybe just a couple of utilities uh, to help make life easier. So now we need Python. Um, I am showing you a document generated using ASCII Doctor, and I sort of chose this, I chose this because I really like it. You get this nice look uh, without having to do a lot of styling. It's got nice links. It's, like, it's a really good choice for a single page document that you just need to be able to post somewhere. But also I chose it to show you that, hey, you know what, ASCII Doctor depends on Ruby. It's no big deal because we can just add Ruby as a dependency in our Docker file. It'll be installed as part of our build process and we can do it. So basically this is just showing you the next step is let's install Ruby, let's install this thing that depends on Ruby and we'll go from there. All right, and then I'm using uh, the SymPy discrete event simulation framework to do the actual example of reproducible research that I'm going to show you. So we need to install that and we're going to install Dexy for for generating the docs. Um, and then another thing we'll need to do in our Docker file is actually create a user um, and set things up for that user to, to work. Again, this is the stuff that usually is taken care of for you when you build a new machine, but for Docker, you've got to find an automated way to, to do that. So this is how I do it. Okay, so we've got a Docker file. It's got all the dependencies that we need, and now we need to run it, which is as simple as running the docker run command. Oops, sorry, I've got the wrong order. Uh, Sorry, it's supposed to be the docker build. There's a docker build command. Here's the docker run command. Oh, sorry, there's a docker build command. Um, and this is the command that's going to have us run this docker file. Um, and we're gonna, it's going to give us an interactive terminal that we're going to work with. So I'm going to go ahead and do this now. Um, so this is, I'm in my project. I have a bunch of Python files. I have a docker file. I have um, an ASCII doc source document. Um, and I've got a script called run docker, which I'm going to run right now. 
And you're seeing that it very, very quickly has generated uh, this Docker image because I've, the Docker build has cached all these steps for me. So these are steps that have, I've been running earlier. Because nothing changed in the Docker file, it's going to just take these from the cache, and so it's going to build very quickly. If I had changed anything in the Docker file, it would have had to go and repeat that step and fetched and installed that software, whatever it has to do. So the Docker file, and Dexy has a similar caching system where if you haven't changed anything, it's going to run very quickly. And if you have, it's going to invalidate your cache because, okay, it's the reproducibility. We want to have things invalidated if the cache has, has uh, sorry, we want the cache invalidated if something has changed. So now um, our prompt looks a little different and we're actually inside this container now. So now we have access to all the software that's available on this container. Um, I'm working on a Mac, and, but this container is running Ubuntu. So I now have access to all the Ubuntu software I want in this, in this virtual machine. I also have a directory called work, which, uh, which is actually uh, uh, the mounted directory from the host file systems that I was working on. So what I've created now is an interactive workspace, um, and any commands I execute within this interactive workspace are going to run on the Docker container on the virtual machine, so they have access to all that software on the virtual machine. But I can edit the files locally on my host operating system. And when I'm done, the generated outputs are going to be put onto my host operating system. Um, so this means I basically have a fully disposable, fully reproducible environment, but I can use it in an interactive way, accessing my host file system, and I can use my usual tools to work with my host files. Uh, so this is Vim running on my host operating system, editing the files. Changes I make here because that file is mounted are going to appear uh, within the container and I'll be able to, to act on those. So here is an example taken from the SymPy examples. Um, and I'm not going to go through this, it's, it's doing a, a movie renege simulation. The important thing is that it prints out a bunch of statements at the end. And what I have here in my document um, first of all, I have the source code of this script, which is living in a source code file on my hard drive. The source code of this script is not embedded in the ASCII doc document, but Dexy is the thing that's highlighting it and pulling it into the ASCII doc document and rendering it. Um, Dexy is also executing this script, capturing the output and inserting the output into this script. So what I'm going to do is change the random seed of this simulation and it was set to 42. I'm going to set it to 43. I am going to run Dexy. I'm going to refresh this browser. And um, if you were paying attention, these numbers have changed. We can go back to our script and see that the random seed has also changed. So what I've done here is updated the source file and just ran a single command, which is the Dexy command, which has regenerated, it's re-executed the code, recaptured the output, reapplied the syntax highlighting, and it's regenerated the HTML document that's coming from a, a, a static source code file. And I'm gonna skip forward a little bit just because uh, for time, um, and this is a this is a graph that I've generated using a slightly modified version of this script. And just because it's a little easier to see, I'm going to go ahead and change the random seed. Um, so I've modified this to separate out a settings file rather than having the settings embedded in the script. I've got a settings file and an output file, which is sort of a more Dexy way to do things because it means you can do things like access. Uh, the values in that settings file from your documents. Um, so a nice approach to take is that you want to be able to not hard code things like what was the random seed, how many tickets did we, how many tickets did we sell, and what was the simulation time. Um, so we want to be able to write our documents more flexibly than just being, having to include a static output from a script that's sort of a plain text. So we have here, uh, this, is, this is written in ASCII doc. And instead of pulling out the output from running your script, we're actually reading values from the source files and embedding them, uh, embedding them in real time and also generating an image. And so, let me just make sure I changed it. 
So this is, we've changed the random seed to 43 from 42. Run this again. So now our random seed is 43, and uh, the graph has updated as well. So you have an arbitrary number of static artifacts that you can generate, an arbitrary number of documents that you can generate. And basically, the nice thing is everything gets updated when something has been modified. Um, so this is a very nice complete stack, uh, and Dexy is going to handle your project automation, your document automation. Docker is going to handle your environment automation. And basically, if I give you a project repository that has a Docker file and that has a Dexy file, uh, that should be all the information you need uh, to actually successfully run that and reproduce that yourself. Um, so please come find me and talk to me about your project, and I am more than happy uh, to brainstorm with you about the best ways to apply this to your project. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Okay, in your example, uh, the Docker file you have like from Ubuntu and later. Yeah. For reproducibility, isn't that a bit of an anti -tank? So, so this is. This is sort of a, a tension in reproducibility, and there's two potential goals you might have. Um, and one of one of these goals is, hey, I, I, I read your paper last year, and I'd like to know exactly what you did to reproduce that paper. I want to reproduce that exactly. For that scenario, you want to have the exact Ubuntu version that you use, the exact versions of all the software packages that were involved. Um, and the other the other usage example is, hey, I read your paper last year. I, I get that, that's fine. Now I want to modify your research and do new research going forward using your Docker file. In that case, you want the latest versions of something, and if something isn't quite right, you actually want to notice that and fix that and change that. So um, basically, I tend to use the, like I'm working in an up-to-date scenario. If you wanted to have an archival version, um, it'd be really nice, this doesn't exist yet, it'd be really nice to have a reporting tool or a tool that could generate that, hey, here's the static version of this Docker file with today's versions of things, which would be a matter of parsing it and figuring out, okay, how do I extract this? So I think it's, that depends very much on which goal uh, you have. Um, and those tools should not be that difficult to develop, but they don't exist yet. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Let's, oh, one, last one. Yeah. Uh, so, is truly reproducible not just for all the things that you're doing? Yes, yeah, so um, a lot. For the types of research that I've done, so we, what, we, what I just showed was a simulation where basically the input data is a random seed. And, and I like that, that's the example, that's my background. And the issue there, the reason reproducibility is extremely useful there is you have no data, you've got to generate the data, that's a huge part of it. Um, yes, if you have an existing data set that you're working with, then capturing that reproducibly is really important. If you're working with a small enough data set that it's part of your source code repository, that's, you know, that's one way to handle that where it's just checked in with everything else. So when you check it out, you've got whatever version is appropriate. If you have to work with an external repository, um, then that's going to be a question of how you get that data and you'll just have to capture that in that way. So if you are fetching it from some sort of an API, hopefully there's a way of capturing that either in your Docker file where you fetch that data or maybe in your Dexy uh, in a script where you fetch it and you would have to do it at that point. That's a good question. Unfortunately, we need to cut it here. Thank the, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Good job.